Welcome to episode number two of the Magnetic Marketing Podcast, and this is a special episode that I am so excited to bring to you. Um, there are two of the biggest legends in direct response marketing. Um, obviously, they are Dan Kennedy and Jay Abraham, and this is one of the rare times where we got both of them in a room together where Dan was actually interviewing Jay about some of his strategies and concepts and principles, and um, listening in on this interview for me was one of the most amazing things I think I've ever experienced. I hope you enjoy it as well. Um, this is something that's very rare and very unique and a gift we wanted to give to you guys. So with that said, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Magnetic Marketing Podcast. I don't think there's anybody that has had a bigger impact in the field of direct response than Dan Kennedy. The legend of Dan Kennedy should be ignored at your own peril. They're not really lessons, they're kind of laws that you live by. Dan opened my eyes to what small business marketing looks like. Dan teaches strategic direct response that is timeless. His ripple effect touches people who don't even know his name. The world as we know it was changed because Dan Kennedy became obsessed with marketing. Welcome to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with your host, Dan Kennedy. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Diamond Call. Uh, I have with me, as most of you know, and who I will get to in just a few seconds, uh, Jay Abraham, he arguably needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him a brief one anyway. Um, but um, I apologize for being a few minutes late. Uh, Jay and I don't talk to each other often enough, and we got involved in a uh, meaning of life on this planet conversation for old lions, and uh, <laughs> it, it really was not it really was not appropriate for everybody's uh, uh, consumption. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, I have no real commercial announcements. Uh, for those of you who were just at the big June mid-year mind hijacking event, thank you very much. We had a great event. Um, uh, as a side note, um, whether you were there or not, and you will see it in a newsletter, but uh, um, we had our biggest year mid-year event ever in terms of contributions to our charities. We raised over $77,000 um, uh, from, you know, a relatively small group. So that was cool. And that, and for those of you who, who uh, participated, um, even if you were not a direct donor in that particular activity, your participation and attendance and support of the event uh, made it possible. Um, and I believe we are at 63 or 64 pre-registered for next June, so that's cool, too, and thank you for that. Um, next GKIC thing coming up uh, of big significance is the Info Summit, and to my knowledge, there is no real information about it yet posted at the site, so I don't need to tell you to go look, uh, let alone do anything else. So I think that's uh, all the commercial stuff. Uh, that I have to do. And so we will get to Jay and uh, allow time for Q&A. Uh, Global Traveler, he has just rattled off countries he's been at recently, and uh, more power to him. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Jay has long history of um, probably best known as a strategist, in developing uh, really sophisticated marketing strategies for companies, large and small, spanning thousands of businesses and hundreds of separate industries and professions and product categories and service categories. Um, God only knows how many multi-day seminars and trainings and all of that over the years. Uh, he's very well known for concepts of risk reversal, uh, kind of as a king of joint ventures, which is one of the specific things I'm going to ask him to talk about. Um, his media plaudits are uh, long, long, long list. New York Times, USA Today, um, um, Entrepreneur Success, Inc., Forbes. Um, and uh, he and I have known each other and occasionally uh, been on the same dance cards. Um, <laughs> For uh, um, for more time than either of us cares to count, um, and uh, he has graciously agreed to, with no particular agenda, 
um, uh, be with us and let his brain be probed. So, Jay, thank you very much. It's my honor. Come on. Uh, uh, my admiration for your work is is uh, equivalent, so this is a delight and a, and a, and a treat for me. Well, uh, I don't believe you play golf, but I'm sure you had something else you could have been doing, and so it is, <laughs> yeah. it is, uh, it is much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let me let me start, um, if I may, with a um, J. Abraham, um, I think uniquely languaged concept, um, which you have referred to as ambivalent uncertainty and um, I, I think that you know we we live in an increasingly fragmented media environment and a confused consumer uh, environment and uh, massive amounts of choice in front of them in every category and yet I think this refers to a choice that that marketers often overlook, they don't think of as being in their way. And uh, so I wonder if you just talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, it's, uh, I'll approach it from a, um, a multiplicity of, of uh, vantage points. So the first thing is everyone thinks they're competing against uh, direct competitors. In actuality, you're, you're competing against direct competitors. You're competing against alternative competitors. But you're really competing against apathy, ambivalence, uh, procrastination, equivocation, contemplation. And it is, it is a huge, huge, um, I don't want to call it, it's, it's an anchor that most people don't recognize. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Mary Lou Tyler, do you know her? It does not ring a bell. Okay, well, she did work for Salesforce, and, and she does a lot of sophisticated work, and she came up with four categories of, of buyers. One is basically unaware, uninterested. One's aware, uninterested. One's aware, interested, but not really compelled. One's aware, interested, compelled, but not decisive. And you have to realize there's a lot of gradients in the world. When I was about... Uh, 40, I did a lot of work with a couple of uh, very bright people who, and I've been blessed, uh, Dan, truthfully, because I've had mentors that were way above my intellectual skill set, and they've shared perspectives to me. And one of them was the formation of this concept that I think I'm known for called the strategy of preeminence. And the whole premise is you've got to put words into people's minds that for the first time crystalline what it is they're trying to get away from, what they're trying to get close to, what the outcome is, what they want, what they're afraid of. You've got to then show them an alternative to where they are that is so compelling, and it's all based on a role of taking leadership. And um, and I've been very well skilled in that because I've had to deal with it and have to find ways to make it easier for people to take a step forward and feel uh, not just safe, but that they won't be embarrassed. They won't be. Uh, they, there's there's so many different levels of risk that most people don't think about, and they think about monetary risk as opposed to looking bad risk, uh, uh, reflective uh, regrets that I didn't do this instead of that, and and I factor all that in. I don't know if I'm taking you down the right road of response or whether I'm taking a tangent. Is, is that what you wanted? Or yeah, you no, I think you're absolutely, you know, I think you're, first of all, I think a lot of people start further along the path toward acquiring a customer than any of their prospects are positioned at. Well stated. And, right, and so there's this assumption, as you said, that we need to deal with their competitive options, but they're not even close to that point yet and 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 I also think it, that most marketers um, I would say they you know when when we go look at ourselves in the mirror in the morning we don't see scary monsters uh, <laughs> but, but you know our prospects do and and the longer we do what we do 
the more we take for granted the fact that we're not scary or intimidating uh, to anybody, when in fact just the act of Bob and Martha, 63-year-old retirees, getting in a car and driving to a Holiday Inn they've never been to before on the opposite side of town to come to a free financial advisor workshop is is as scary as you or I deciding that we're going to go vacation in Iran. Yeah, that's wonderfully uh, stated. And you're right. right. And most people don't recognize it. No. And, 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 the, and the third thing that you hit on is the, the emotional risk, the esteem risk, um, looking bad to sell for others that people often leave out of the equation. A lot of dentists get it now, you know, that um, somebody that hasn't been to a dentist for a long time um, is reluctant now to come to the dentist because they're going to look bad to the dentist. And maybe they're going to get a lecture and, you know, they're, they're not, they're not going to be uh, handled well. And that has nothing to do with fear of pain or fear of price or all the stuff that most people normally uh, sweat. Uh, but you went right to uh, where I was going to go next, which is your whole uh, approach to preeminence, um, to it, – it, it's almost hackneyed to call it positioning, um, but um, – Category of one, all of that kind of terminology. I wonder if you just talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be and, privileged and, and, to, and, and maybe even a client, you know, a situation. Sure, absolutely. Example. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it it normally takes about three hours to explain. And by the way, anything that you broach upon that you want, Dan, I will be glad to send you. So you can it can reside on your your website that, that people don't have to even come to me for this because some of this stuff is really profound and we've done hours and hours on it. But I had a, I've had a, a number of pivotal uh, sort of epiphanies and and uh, and uh, attitudinal shifts in my life based on um, being catalytically impacted by different people. And about 20 years ago, I was working with. Uh, well, I tell you, it was Phillips Publishing, and at that time they were just killing it. And I was close to the guy that ran it, and I was trying to figure out what they were doing so much different. And I did a trade. I gave them half a million dollars of my services, and they let me hang out and interview everybody for about, I don't know, uh, three weeks. And I just took notes, and I had a 1,000 pages of notes, and I distilled it, and then I'd, I shifted it and moved it around and tried to figure out what the hell it was telling me. And from that I evolved uh, a thesis, a uh, a strategic philosophy, a philosophical strategy that becomes, in my mind, the guiding foundation for which I create everything for clients. And I call it the strategy of preeminence. And it's designed to make and position you as the only viable choice, the most trusted advisor for life, even if what you sell is a singular product or service. It's designed to help you connect in a most authentic and uh, penetrating way and a level that transcends superficial copy. It becomes the foundation of your advertising, your selling, your cultural. And I'll give you just some of the easy parts about it. So the first thing is you you start with, uh, well, I'll tell you, I'm going to do it ass backwards because the biggest insight in it is most people in business fall in love with either the business or making money or the product or service or the category. When you're preeminent, you fall in love with the client and you, you, you actually, um, let me see if I can use the right word. You're very aware and comprehensive of the transformative or the protective or the enriching or the entertaining impact you are going to, your product or service or company at work in their lives is going to have you you um, you spend time trying to understand examine evaluate appreciate uh, acknowledge and uh, and recognize how they see life because no two people see life at the same way no two people define a word the same way you start very methodically 
working on being able to present yourself as having an alternative position because most people think the system sucks, it's trying to take advantage, and if you look at most generic pe people or competitors, they are, you establish that there is a better alternative and you have it. You are totally externally focused. You basically, uh, now you've got a moral obligation. I'm giving you a lot of things con you know, compiled together. You have a moral obligation if you're going to be the most trusted advisor to never let a client or a prospect buy less than they should, in less combination they should, in less quality than they should, in less frequency than they should, in less uh, progression than they should, not because you're going to lose money, but because they're not going to get the maximum outcome. And you have the moral obligation to explain it to them. And I'll give you two really interesting examples that are rapid. Let's say that I had Jay Abraham's bottled water shop and water uh, bar, and you came in, Dan, and you asked for a half a glass of water, and I just served it to you without at least uh, respectfully and not arrogantly or uh, or admonishingly, but just, just heartfelt saying, you know, Dan, you need to have seven and a half more of those every day so that your brain chemistry works, your 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 mind is operating at at perfection, your cellular structure is working, your your stress level is down, your your life is and and and, and I and I have an obligation to tell you what is in your best interest. Then if you don't want to opt for it, at least I have exercised my obligation as opposed to just taking your sale. Number two is uh, when you want to be the most trusted advisor, you do not want to refer to a buyer, I don't, as a customer. I want to refer to them as a client, and there's a reason why. If you look at uh, Webster's Dictionary's definition of a customer, it's somebody who buys a commodity or a service. In a world where there are three factors trying to basically commoditize and marginalize you, the competition, the alternative competition and the consumer for you to concede is lunacy you want to refer to them as a client for three reasons number one if you look up uh, the definition of a client it basically is someone under the care the protection the well-being of another it has a very higher and more elevated um, um, uh, context you live that you have a tendency to operate at a much higher level you tend to want to uh, contribute more everybody thinks and this is uh gonna gonna be default because a lot of people are into copy that what do i have to say how much more do i have to say to get the sale and it's not the right question the question is how much more do i have to contribute or give a value and a value that is that is acknowledged and appreciated by them since there's value on our side doesn't mean anything to the recipient it has uh uh, remember, I mean, there's just a lot of elements, but it's a very elevated way of operating, and it's it tends on some so some examples. Uh, years ago, when I did investment rarities, a very big gold company, everybody else was selling gold direct. Our deal is we wouldn't even let you buy gold until you first got the case for it. Then, if you wanted to buy it, we wouldn't let you buy all you wanted. You had to buy junk gold first or bullion, just so that you were comfortable and you got. You saw, you know, and, and you felt, and uh, you know, the, the the mystique and the reason why. And if you didn't like it, you're down two percent or three percent. Then we'd let you buy junk uh, uh, silver. Then we'd let you buy other things. And we were much more uh, slow and methodical, but we did about ten times the amount of business and the average sales. Uh, when we did, I mean, I used to do, as you said, very large seminars. Here's how we did our seminars. Uh, there were $15,000, $20,000 25 years ago. First thing we would do is we would send everybody, but this long before anyone ever did this, a two-hour interview of me that was purely content and get about 12 things people could do immediately. If they were interested, they would call, and they would they would uh, be invited to sign up, but we would not we would not um, bank their check or deposit their credit card. We would, however, send them 2000 or $3,000 worth of materials for anyone who ever did that. And our, our, our proposition was if you can't use that before you even come,
to make more money than the program, we insist on you canceling and you can keep the materials. Then when they came to the program, we wouldn't deposit their uh, check or or credit card until uh, 2 o'clock on the third day of a five-day program. And uh, so that if, you know, and we couldn't repossess. So we did lots of things that were different for, uh, you know, for uh, a lot of clients. We will buy. We, I never, I don't believe that I've done a lot of, uh, of comments on this. I don't believe in free. I know free is really, uh, you know, the universal forever uh, bromide for everything. But I think in today's world with so much crap that's free, you're much better buying somebody something that has value. Uh, for example, just in preeminence, when I started out, my my, my price is very high. It's $100,000 a day. But I don't really care if I do a $100,000 a day. I want it to be a contrast to somebody wanting to do a longer-term deal where I get a, a, a fair fee, but I get uh, to, to, to uh, participate in, in the variable. But when I used to do exploratory conversations, it was... $2,000 a day. And I'd say, sure, I'll buy, you know, I wouldn't say, I'd say, come on, I'll, I'll, you can have you can have 15 minutes on the phone with me free. And that would be very ineffective. And then I started changing the perspective. I got a huge, huge hourglass that was 15 minutes. And I would tell people, look, I'll buy you $500 of my time and we'll explore it. And the moment they walked in, I would turn the hourglass over and they're watching the grains fall. But I'm going to give you lots of examples. I mean, um, is that enough or you want more? Yeah, well, it, what it does, I mean, so in, in many of those examples at the very kind of grainy tactical level, you've got to risk risk reversal. That is true. But bigger, it, uh, it, it, is, it is about this uh, focus on the, on, and you rattled off the categories, of the transformation, transformational experience of the client, not on the product, service, proposition, value proposition, you know, et cetera. I have a, um, a, um, an internal Disney document um, that actually was tucked inside an old Disney training manual that I bought at an auction. Okay. And it's handwritten. I don't know whose handwriting it is. Um, but... Um, it has the page divided in the middle. I've done this in some of my books coincidentally. And in this case, on one side, it has the business uh, people think we're in. And then on the other side, it has the business we're actually in. And then on the business people think we're in, the person wrote movies. And then on the side, the business we're really in, there's 22 or 23 items, the last one of which is movies. And the other items are like um, uh, 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 reinforcing the morals and values that parents want their kids to have. Uh, and there's like 22 of those. And finally arriving at, yeah, oh, by the way, we we do all this with movies. And I I, I think very few people ever really make that list. You know, they confuse their deliverable, as I usually put it, with the business they're in, when in reality those are two very different things. And you got to it brilliantly, and a lot of people just miss it entirely. Yeah. Well, if I can respectfully interrupt, when I uh, teach it informally, I say, even if you're an ice cream vendor, you're doing it because you have the joy of knowing that an adult who's getting an ice cream cone is getting a reprieve from the insanity of their life for 15 minutes. They're getting a nostalgic reinforcement of a better, easier, less stressful time, and you're able to make that possible, not just by, you know, scooping it and vending it, but by being there, by, you know, smiling. And people don't realize that they think that's a lot of, of you know, uh, I don't know what the word I want to use is, uh, tang tangitor or tangent, uh, tangential or wasteful. But there's something I'm uh, and and whether you 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 hit on this or not, I probably should preemptively say 
One of the things I think I am more, and it's not arrogant, it's clinical, more focused on than most is nuances. I don't mm-hmm. think most people understand nuances. Well, in part, I think they don't understand them, and in another part, I think they're in a hurry. Um, and they don't slow down to think about them. Um, you know, when you when you just um, kind of quickly crapped on superficial copy, um, uh, it should be noted that I write a lot of superficial copy. Uh, but, but I don't think you do. I really don't but, think well, you do. I mean, the, the point I was about to make is that everybody's in a big hurry to get to the damn copy. And I have to slow clients down so that I can slow down because all of the stuff you do before you write the copy is infinitely more important. And one of those things has to do with all these nuances is trying to understand what the recipient, prospect, customer, client, patient, what what they're all about and trying to understand what the provider of the product or service is really all about or should be all about. But everybody wants to jump to the features, benefits, uh, differential advantage, price offer list, and, you know, let's get this done. And I think the Internet has not helped this. I agree. You know, there's enormous pressure to be instant. And, And that just tramples over any nuanced consideration. And, and yet, I can I can tell you that when you take the time, I'll, let me give you a very interesting example and extrapolate because it, it's one of my my references. I had a client a couple of years ago, and it was really a complex client, and I'd spent months struggling over how to articulate. They were competing with ADP, and they were competing with uh, QuickBooks, and, and it was a, it was not just a competitive uh, proposition, but it was a whole cultural change. They had to get accountants to make, and then accountants would have to get um, uh, their clients to make. It was very challenging, and it needed a lot of of perspective. And I had a meeting with the client, let's say on Monday, and I'd been working on this honestly, mercilessly, and and far. Uh, beyond the compensation for six weeks, and I destroyed about seven different versions, and I'd been studying everything I could. And I come from the Claude Hopkins school that you study 10,000 pages looking for a paragraph, and I'm exhausted. And I got an inspiration that was really cool. But I got it two days before the meeting, and I started redoing everything. And I called my assistant two hours before and said, Please tell the client that I've been working on this incessantly for what I just said, six weeks. I've got 17 drafts. I've thrown away. I've read 25,000 pages. I finally found a breakthrough I think will resonate with the accountants and move them to be able to to persuade their clients, but it's taken a lot longer. I'd like to move the meeting to uh, uh, Thursday, so I'll be ready to deliver. And her message to the client is, Jay doesn't have time to talk today, maybe Thursday. And all the nuances <laughs> were lost. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Yep. It's it's uh, one of the things that were very interesting to me. Uh, that I, 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 mean, I, I love this about Gary Howard. He had the, the story about the uh, the tugboat. You know that one. Yes. And I always think people, people don't really understand that very well. And it's the same thing with the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal. And most people try to get right to the right to the to the, to the pay dirt, in, you know, in their copy or their sales approaches. Well, even in to your point about your about your assistant, even in communication. I mean, it's why I stubbornly. It's one of the reasons I absolutely stubbornly refuse to let anybody email me, let alone tweet me. Because it invites thoughtless communication. And offensive, um, and unintentionally offensive communication. Yes. And when somebody has to slow down at least long enough to, like, put it on a page and put it in a fax machine, it helps them. 
And, you know, a lot of this email and tweet stuff is one step away from a drunken butt dial in the middle of the night and it's leaving a, great a message visual. on, you know, somebody's voicemail that you sure wish you hadn't left. And and I, it just goes on all the time. Yeah, I have a very self sort of, and then I want to ask you about joint ventures. You but, ask me anything you want. Uh, well, in between. So because he's from so far away, I'm going to accommodate him, even though this winds up um, self-aggrandizing for both of us. Um, a guy on the call, a member of ours, Ellery, not sure how you say the last name, L-E-U-N-G, Luang maybe, um, is in Hong Kong. Okay. So I don't know what time it is over there. I don't know if it's the middle of the night or last week. He's well, he's, 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 he's honoring us. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, so... Um, he wants uh, you to answer what are the one or two ideas that are Dan's that you admire most and what's and wants me to answer the same thing about you. Um, so um, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Yeah, I, I think that you are, um, you are, and I've said this to people uh, behind your back with, 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 with a laudatory admiration, you understand human nature at a deeper and more honest level, and you do not you're not you're not um, pandering, patronizing, superficial, or veneer about it. You understand uh, the self-servingness of humanity. You understand the short-sightedness of humanity. You understand. Uh, I won't use the word ignorance, but the naivete of humanity. Well, let's call it the ignorance and the arrogance. And you understand very masterfully how to deal with that. And I think that cleverly concealed uh, beneath a facade of curmudgeonness is a very compassionate person who doesn't want... You're a tough love guy who wants people to take action and take shit seriously. And I admire that. I mean, there's a lot of other things, but is that okay? Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'll transcribe it and use it. Okay, um, you can use it with my attribution. <laughs> um, I often tell people that um, you are not only a far deeper thinker, about business in general than most, but about leverage and and sort of finding and unearthing the ways to make more um, out of what's already flowing through the system, um, whereas everybody tends to be focused on how to go externally and get or create more. And more beneficially to people who really pay attention to you, you make deeper thinkers out of them. Um, I think that your your content, your material. I just reread um, last night um, uh, the Sticking Point book. Okay. So, and of course, I have your stuff dating back. You know, to when we got it on stone tablets. <laughs> if you want another supply uh, of the new stuff, tell me it's yours, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, but see, I think you challenge people more than almost any other speaker, trainer, author, consultant. Um, you can't really breeze your stuff um, if you are going to pay attention to your stuff you actually have to be thoughtful and analytical. And and I think that maybe is your greatest. Um, uh, and, and, and thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, if I can explain it, it might help people. Yeah, go, sure. If you do, if you want it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go. So, I mean, those who don't know my background, it was very accidental. I have no education. I got started young, two kids. And nobody would give me a paying job, so I only got people who'd let me sit in the corner and get pieces of deals or so much a sale or whatever. And um, when you only when you only eat when when you when you only eat when you earn, you figure out what works and then what works better. 
but I was bored and I changed industries, not jobs, frequently. And after about 10, I realized that people in one industry didn't have a clue how people in another industry thought, how they, how they, um, marketed the strategy, business model, access model, uh, anything. And I started being able to borrow integrations from other industries and apply them to industries that didn't know them. And my, my, my performance just, uh, for those companies just doubled, redoubled it. So it was very phenomenal. Concurrently, over the course, I mean, I really work mostly with real clients on the front lines of, uh, of commerce. I have Dan knows this when we were, at our peak, I think we did a quarter billion dollars, and I sort of burnt out on doing that. But uh, I'll tell you three things that were interesting. First of all, I had clients that were that forced me to understand leverage. One of them was the Deming organization, the father of of optimization process improvement that was designed for manufacturing. But I was able to understand all the variation and extrapolate it and see how it applied to the revenue side. Then I had a, another company called Qualpro. <clears throat> they were the largest multivariable testing organization in the world, and they did back then uh, for millions of dollars clients. Now you can get the premium you know, online and get a lot of the same thing, but I got to look at billions of dollars of variation tests on everything from customer service to putting retail SKUs, different facings, positions, uh, uh, things like that. Then I had the largest strategic litigation consulting firm, which is called Decision Quest, and I got to look at billions of dollars. They had 150 PhD psychologists, uh, sociologists, and I got to look at all the differentiation on things like venue, on issues, you know, all the, the mock juries, plus they had a, a graphic division, and I got to see it's almost like a forensic accountant, whether you're, whether you're depicting pain and suffering or not. Then uh, I, <clears throat> I had a standing offer. I've done about two or three hundred of the top experts in the market. None of them came to me for help with their basic methodology. They came to raise the perception, to you know, to command greater preeminence, to maybe develop either higher level uh, variations. But I had to learn the short course on all their methodology. So I got that, and then I've been in 180, it's going to be 460 industries, and I spend my days untangling Gordian knots. So you get an understanding of stuff that is much deeper, and you realize how much more is possible. And finally, towards your your comment about, um, and I want to say something to the man in, in Hong Kong that's very relevant, towards your comment about... Um, um, uh, oh shoot! About uh, leverage, I realized after a f- few years that I was able to see infinite tangible and intangible points internally and externally of leverage, and that the average company has 25 to 50 impact points, leverage points going on internally that they don't even recognize, let alone know how to uh, measure, quantify, let alone know how to enhance. And then somebody taught me. Well, basically, the the power of geometric thinking, finally, just to the man in Hong Kong, my voice is going, so let me just get a quick sip of water, and I'll I'll shut up after that. I've done an enormous amount of work in China, and I'll use a story from China. It's a great one about uh, relational uh, capital or joint ventures. Um, Japan, uh, Malaysia just came back from Bangkok. The one advantage... They have an advantage over us, and we have an advantage over them. Their advantage is they have a very impressive work ethic. They're more driven, I think, to achieve right now than we are. The disadvantage is their educational system is based or has been based on rote training, which basically is memorization. So if I said to somebody from China, that's why I'm very beloved in China because I teach critical thinking. But if I say to somebody, uh, 100 divided by 300 plus 12 divided by 7 square root plus 22, they'll give me the answer instantly. But if I say this is to this as this is to that, what's the implication? What's the, you know, what's the correlation? 
I get deer in the headlights. So it's just an aggregate response, probably much more than you wanted. That's all right. Let's let's get a little greeny on joint ventures. Okay, and go. Then we're gonna go to Q, and then we're going to go to Q and A. Um, so you uh, have a terrific track record and a great reputation of sort of uh, making deals. I mean, putting two parties together who don't see. Uh, and I have a preparatory story first, uh, real quick, because you'll appreciate it. And it even goes to your people in two industries side by side don't know what the other ones are doing, and you take from one and give to the other. Years ago, um, I had a uh, client who one of the signs he had on his wall was never underestimate the sloth of the American people. <laughs> and uh, uh, so one day he said, let me show you why nobody has an excuse ever to be broke. And he took, and this was in a relatively small town. He took the newspaper and he opened it up to the classifieds and he found, uh, 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 dogs for sale. And there were eight or ten ads of dogs for sale. And then he said, look over here, next column over is dogs wanted. And there's eight, ten, twelve ads in there of people describing dogs they want. And they're literally on the same page of the newspaper. And so he like circles three of them, and he gets on the phone, and he he says, "I see you got X Y, you got this dachshund for sale, and how much do you want for the dachshund? And tell me about the dachshund." He says, "I'll call you right back." And he now calls somebody out of the other column and says, "I see you want a dachshund. Tell me about the dachshund you want. How much will you pay for the dachshund?" He says, "Great, I'll call you right back." He calls the other one and says, "I'll take the dachshund." He calls them back and says, "I got the dachshund, and you can have it." And he made a hundred bucks on the spread, right? And and this is really how, you know, blinders on people are, is they're in whatever business they're in, and right next to them can be a, a model that they could borrow liberally from, and they never even, like, notice it's there. You're right. And it's remarkable when you think about, in your and my career times, I mean, we're both pre-internet. That's right. So, I think we're both probably pre-FedEx. And I am, um, yes. Um, so, but you think about all the visibility now of what once was relatively invisible, and still people have the same blinders on, and and they don't see much. So, sort of, it's a precursor. So, you're a great deal maker. You're a great G party A doesn't know they could match this up with party B, and party B doesn't know party A's got it, and I'll put them together. Uh, you're a great, you know, leverage even kind of barter guy. So give me your five minutes on all of that, on, on JVs. Okay. Most people, if you think about advertising, you think about external promotion, uh, most people are going to the outer periphery of of uh, a, a, a prospective or a suspective market, trying to start the very first stage of trust. Would you agree that? Yeah. Okay. Yep. When in fact, if you take a deep breath and think about it, there are an enormous number of organizations, publications, influencers. Uh, uh, complementary, uh, competitive companies that already have the trust. And if you can make alignment with them, you have shortened the, uh, the, the trust building credibility process enormously. Number one, you've not wasted money on advertising or marketing. You've moved, uh, your, your, uh, your, your structure to a result based uh, compensation and you get to uh, you get to leverage off of millions tens of millions hundreds of millions of dollars of historic investment in relationship and in infrastructure and in whether it's product service that these other companies have so the point is that that's one point the other point is whatever you're selling there uh, there is the question to ask is who all has the same buying influence right now. The next question is, 
What do my people buy before, during, after, instead? The next question is, uh, how can I be basically the tail that, all, that wags the dog? And I'll just, I can go on and on, but the point is that there's always somebody that has the market you want or, or the problem you're trying to solve is solving a bigger problem for someone else, but they don't always know it. This is almost like pretty much you've got to, you've got to explain it. So let me give you some examples real quickly. And I'll go through them rat tat tat and, and, uh, I'll, I'll end up with one. Uh, that happened in Asia, so you'll get a kick out of it. So when I started, we didn't have any money. I'll go with ISAT. ISAT, we had no money. So I went to a 1,000 radio stations, television stations, and we made deals where whenever they had unsold time, they made it available to us. They sold our product. We gave them not 100% of the revenue, but more than 100%. Let them keep all the product. We just wanted the name so we could have the second sale. And we got... Uh, a thousand people doing it. We got $25 million worth of exposure. We accidentally forced retail, created a product that was, instead of a mail order company, uh, a consumer product, sold it for $60 million to Searle. That was 40 years ago. When and I did, hopefully without derailing you, I must make this point, because I fight with people about this all the time. The most important thing you said is you gave them more than 100% of the money and the product. Yep. You didn't care anything, but give me the name yep. of of the bar. People get so cheap about this. It, it's and and they're constantly trying to get by with giving the other side as little as they can. And, and we're the opposite. Yeah, we'll, we'll give them. I mean, we play a long game, and I think you you. But for example, most people, and I don't want to go there and, as this, but lifetime. Well, I'll tell you, a lifetime value deal is pretty interesting. So. Uh, well, I'll go through it, but most people don't have a clue what a buyer's worth, what a different caliber of buyer's worth, what a source is worth, what a category of buyer's worth. And if you don't know that, basically, you either spend too little or too much. But like with ICOT, just to go back to it, we had ascertained something that every time we got 10 new buyers, eight of them stayed literally forever. And back then, it was so cheap. We were spending 55 cents in the mail bulk, and we were making 245 so we gave away 345 for everybody who would bring in $3, but we could have literally given away $20 or 30 And if we didn't have the cash flow, we could have borrowed it from any source because we had, we had plenty of, of metrics that showed that every time we brought in eight, 10 we were accruing $40 in profit a year forever, and that didn't count the 40% that bought other products, and that didn't count the 20% that bought um, – bulk products and uh and but most people don't look at that and you're right they're short sighted and I'll tell you three or four other examples like that but to go through it so uh that was the first thing I did then I did uh investment rarities we talked about the fact that that uh we didn't let people buy but instead of running ads in Wall Street Journal uh in all the financial ones, we went to all the financial newsletters and became the recommended um, the recommended provider. We would get uh, we would be included in the welcome pack. We would pay for four special issues every month that they would or every year they would put out on us. We would underwrite the cost of regional seminars where we bring great people and they charge and we give all the money to uh, the. Uh, you know the the newsletter we did it with with seminar companies uh at the, at, at the same time we would uh if a if a newsletter had a mailing piece that stopped working we would do one of two things if it was hard money oriented we would buy it and we would repurpose it as a lead generator because we were acquiring leads on the open market for like $200 if it was a newsletter that uh, wasn't good copy. I would fix the headline. I would increase the bonuses. I would increase the risk reversal. And we would take over marketing it because we were basically participating. We got joint tenancy of the name. And we built, uh, well, the, we, they did $2 billion over two years, but the biggest year was was a, a little over $500 million. When I got in the seminar business, everyone was selling seminars for 500 And you know I was started at 15000 
And it's because I went to Tony Robbins. I went to Nightingale Conan. I went to Success Magazine. I went to uh, every financial newsletter out there, and I got them to endorse me. And they had the trust of the entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, let's think of some really cool ones. Uh, and I got a couple really great stories. There was a woman who was the ad agency for Hawaiian uh, Bread, which is a, a big company on the West Coast. She was their ad agency. They were premium bread. It was all over the West Coast and Hawaii. She had a, uh, a, a really high-end chocolate chip cookie formula, and she wanted to get it out there. Hawaiian Bread didn't have anything in that category. This woman didn't have any real resources. She went to a bakery, first of all, and said, it was a bakery that was underperforming, and she said, if I can become, uh, if I can get you uh, uh, payment certain orders, will you give me credit to, pr- to, to make my product, and if I become at least 40% of your volume, can I get equity for nothing? She locked that up. She went to Hawaiian Bread and got them to agree to private, or to put, to, to, you know, to label, uh, you know, their cookie, her cookie through them and put it through their distribution with their guarantee. She basically turned it into a multi-million dollar product. Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian, uh, bread bought it out from her for millions of dollars in a percentage. She, oh, I gotta tell you the story with ice cream too, it was great. When the product, we actually got $25 million worth of advertising in each year for two years, and that was a lot 45 years ago. We forced retail distribution. It was sold to G.D. Searle, which was at the point a large uh, pharmaceutical company who was subsequently absorbed by somebody else, but they didn't even want the mailing list of 500,000 ongoing buyers. We got to keep that, and our only prohibition was we couldn't directly compete back at the ranch. So I did all these seminars with everybody, and I had a model that was great. We would go to everybody first on a list, and we would offer a $50,000 one-day consult. We would be very happy if anybody would respond. I mean, if we we break even, I'd be exhilarated. Then we'd go behind with a letter that said, so many people from from the endorser, so many people were incredulous, fascinated, uh, you know, stunned by somebody who could charge that much money, but the testimonials and the track record looked interesting, and they asked us, is there any way that that they could get access in an affordable way? And we asked Jane, he said, sure, get 500 people together, and, and economies of scale, get them each to pay five grand, and it'll do that. And we filled that all over the place. Then we picked those names off, and we went back and said, so many people said they really wanted to, but either time or even the money still is, is there any way? And we asked Jane, he said, sure, let them have a home study and let them make payments, I don't care. And then we went and went down market after that. So now the next, the next joint venture that's really cool, and I've done so many of them that it is uh, almost laughable. But uh, and, and one that everyone should know, one of the greatest stories of all time, and you probably know it. It's old, but it's it's uh, AARP and Colonial Pen. Colonial Pen was a, a news, excuse me, it was an insurance company set up to do group policies, and they were having great trouble creating really clients and competing. And all of a sudden, somebody basically said, well, why don't you create your own organization? And they created AARP to have a captive client. That's pretty cool, and there's a lot of stories like that. Yep. Uh, I'll give you one that's really cool, and then I'll come back and give you a couple other ones. About No, you don't get the couple other ones. Because uh, I want to get questions. You, you only get one more now. Okay, the, the one I'll give you is great. The one I'll give you is great. Okay. And it's worth giving, and then, I'm sorry, I go on a roll, and Dan, you have to be a diligent taskmaster, so thank you. So, eight years ago, I started going to China, and I had a very large first uh, seminar, and a young man came to the mic and said, uh, what do you do if the, if you're too small and the banks won't lend you money? And I said, well, okay, what would you do with the money if you had it? That's a, that's a big question. People think they need money. All they need is access, assets, uh, resources of other people, distribution, etc. But he said, well, I'm a small local motorcycle company. Only in, in, in China would you have a small, you know, they're 100 million population. And if I had the money, I'd go to other parts of Asia. I would open a factory, I'd hire salespeople, get distribution, and go over Asia. And I said, 
okay, why do you need money? He goes, could you do all that? And I said, no, you don't. All you have to do is find somebody who's complimentary, not competitive, who's got a factory that's underutilized, who's got salespeople, who's got distribution, who's got retailer, and make a partnership with them. That was like three minutes. I came back. A year later, this guy comes back to the mic, and he looks like the Cheshire Cat. And he said, I did what you said. And I didn't even remember because of the three-minute throwaway. And he said, I went to Kuala Lumpur. I found a huge lawnmower manufacturer who was in eight countries. He had a second shift. He was almost not using it all. I had to bring the tools and dyes. I had to do the training. We already had the salespeople. We already had the distributors. We already had eight or 900 lawnmower manufacturers. We split $10 million in profit in uh, in one year. I can tell you like 100 like that, but those are the, some, some starters. All right. Uh, Kerry, in just a minute, um, for about 10 minutes, we're going to let people have – uh, have a whack at Jay. Um, uh, why don't you uh, tell him how to get in line, and then I need to do one quick thing before we take the first uh, call. So at this time, if you have a question, all you need to do is press the number one one time on your phone. Once again, press the number one only once. That'll get you into the question queue, and we'll take order all callers in the order that they're received. All right, uh, Jay. Well, she's snatching the first one. Um, um, I do want you, if you will, you must, you, you undoubtedly have a website where people can go see stuff, find stuff, uh, connect with you, uh, give out whatever you are willing to give out um, or want to, please. Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to. We, we have a website. It's called abraham.com, and the best, the best part of it is uh, uh, abraham.com slash Fifty Shades. I think it's the number fifty. It's got like a thousand hours of video. It's got five hours of of preeminence. It's got interviews. It, and it doesn't sell anything, and you don't even have to opt in. So uh, we do a lot of of uh, contributions, a lot of of uh, investment in, in in the entrepreneurial world because I think uh, it's very important. So uh, there's a lot of very qualitative things there that will help you and they're not selling you know, we sell a few things but it's you're, it's you're very welcome and Dan anything you want to reside on yours I'll be happy to lend you cool so Abraham uh, dot com forward slash number 50 word shades I think it's that or it's the word 50 shades but it's one of the two and that's the best one because it's got enormously provocative and eclectic and very deep stuff on it written video audio all kinds of things, interviews of people that are really profound, uh, very profound. So, stuff you would enjoy. Cool. Thank you much. Thank sir. you. And, and I want to uh, get what you said about me because I love that. I'm gonna play that. I'm gonna play that for my for my uh, my my belt, my ringtone on my phone. Uh, <laughs> all right, Terry. Do we have do we have a player? We do. Uh, our first caller is going to be Ron in Illinois. Ron, your line is open. Hi, gentlemen. Hey, Rob. Um, uh, I had a question in regards to uh, Jay's, uh, what I think is was his first book, is getting getting everything you can out of all you got. What was the inspiration for that? Uh, truthfully, uh, and Dan knows this because he and I have had a lot of, of private conversations. I've had three midlife crises because this is sort of I've reevaluated, and I thought that was going to be my swan song and I wanted to make sure that for its genre it was so powerful because I think it has 336 different uh, examples, case studies and I wanted to do something that was unlike anybody else and uh, I wanted to give people such clarified real world uh, reference examples and and that they could use and uh, I collaborated with it with somebody who was a famous uh, a comedy writer, so it would be eminently, eminently uh, readable, and it would be very, very easy for anyone to grasp applications, implications, adaptations. If you read it today, it's laughable in terms of two things. First of all, the internet stuff is a joke because it's evolved so much, and secondly, uh, some of the things on telemarketing probably are outdated, but it still has some very profound. I mean, it's a wonderful read, and we actually give. Uh, there's four books you can have for gratis on the fully on the website. That one, uh, Sticking Point, 
uh, one called the CEO can see around corners. We got two new ones we're going to give out that just to be contributing that are pretty cool in a couple of weeks. But yeah, just I mean, it's I I've been very privileged to understand universal principles that with slight modification will work in any environment, and I've done it around the world, and and uh, I have a perspective. I'm not I'm not deep in tactical, and I'm, I'm definitely technologically uh, impaired, but what I, you know, no, terrible, I don't turn my computer on. I still use AOL and I pay for it, so it's ludicrous. But, um, but yeah, that book was designed to be a very meaningful and a very, uh, and a very, it was designed to make it harder to, to, uh, discount and, um, and reject than to embrace and uh, effect. It was designed to move people to action. Mm-hmm. What an inspirational answer. See, if the if I had the same question directed to me, I would have said because a publisher offered in advance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 all right, Ron, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the Jerry, question. Next. Okay, next up is going to be Gabriel in Texas. Your line's open. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you today? We're all we're both. Yeah, I think we're good. Go ahead. Thank you. I've been I've been a great fans of both of you for a long time. Dan, you actually introduced me to Jay several years ago, so uh, I have several of your preeminent uh, strategy notebooks, and they've, they've actually helped us greatly too. So thank you, Jay, for that. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, my question for kind of for both of you actually is: we have a unique opportunity now to acquire a complementary company that will one double our income producing assets inventory as well, but it won't double the value of our company. The reason for that is because he grows half of what we did last year. Um, the current owner is more of a doer than the marketer, so he's been kind of struggling, uh, but he does have 10 more years of experience than I do. He does have a plethora of industry uh, contacts, people that I don't know, have never known, probably won't know otherwise, and he does have a desire to become an employee because he wants the stability and not the roller coaster income. So we're, we've been peers for 15 plus years. Uh, we would have a beer if I guess we could, but we're not really friends. So that's the nice thing about that. Uh, he is willing to finance the buyout and a monthly payment, if you will, plus a salary. But my, the trick here is he's also asking, he's asking for this 20 to 25% on the clients and, um, and events that he brings to us. Plus he's also asking for a 5% minority ownership in the company. Of which this, company? Of, of my company, which is net profit. So that's when the question comes to. Well, how can, can, we, I, can I, I, I? Dan, may I? Well, absolutely. So Dr. tell me, tell me what the two businesses do. Well, our company is more of a corporate event services company. Okay, his is a live production company. Okay, now so there, there's a compliment, and and what's I mean? Are you buying it just to sustain it? Are you buying it to grow it? Does it have either uh, high growth profit potential or high growth? Uh, strategic, uh, as, as we were just talking about, uh, uh, reference and connectivity potential. What, what's, what's, what's the method to your madness in wanting to buy it, even if you can buy it on terms? What's it gonna do for you? And what's well, it gonna, what's it gonna, what are you gonna do for it? Everything you just mentioned, one, the growth is, is there because all the events he does don't comp- compete with what we do already. So there's that. Two, the, the contacts, and the ability to go back, and since I'm not more, I'm more on the marketing side now, 90% of my time, which is great because he's still more of the doer, and that's what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. So that could be a good, you know, marriage made there per se. He wants to be in the field. I'd rather be out there marketing, sending offers, and and, uh, and marketing in general. So yeah, he would bring the clients. He would bring the inventory. We could do a straight up buyout. I'm not really crazy about giving him, even if it's small ownership. I suppose I like the idea that he would have a vested interest in the company uh, because he would be looking for a net profit. Uh, all of the expenses he's had, he has, are kind of gone away now because he moved out of his last office. So you can absorb it in your overhead. Exactly, and we already have it. All right, so let me it. ask you a different question. So how much profit does it bring now, and even if it's deferred and can, and you're paying on on a payout, what are you paying for it? Is it a multiple or just is it, what's the rate? See, that's just it. Um, I don't think he has a – I'm going on what he has grossed 
as well as what he's netted. Okay, so, so, what, so it could be anything. It doesn't matter. I'm sorry. So what, what exactly is your question? What's your one? What's he grossing? What's he netting? Oh, he grossed uh, 350, 350 last year. Total. Uh, well, yeah. How many? So, how many clients? That's something I don't know because I asked him to bring that to me. So this is all preliminary. We had a meeting two days ago here in my office. So now you're going to see some more deep due diligence. Exactly. So is he regional, local, national, international? He is regional. Um, he is based here local, but he does do regional shows. What are my you? Company, we are nas- nationwide. We're based locally too, but we do events nationwide. Okay. Well, can you can you expand what he does nationwide, or is that impractical? Actually, I want to take some of his. Uh, assets now, the inventory, and put them into constant use by putting put some of it on tour. Okay. So, that and that's, so he's got a, he's got inventory can be can be leveraged far more and and, and you can get much more utilization and revenue and, and uh revenue out of it, right? Exactly. Okay. Well here's the thing. You see he grossed about three fifty last year, but the total value of his assets are only between two hundred to two fifty. You're talking about the value of the assets including I mean, are you imputing any any value for the business at all? No, see that's what we have not done. He had a, he had a uh, an agreement similar to this that fell apart earlier this year with another company that's more of our competitor that actually cl- uh, filed bankruptcy because they owe sums of money and and back taxes and what have you. So let me ask you a different question. Yes. What did he earn? Net take home, you mean? Approximately, or even if he's up, you know, if he's padded it with his car and everything else, what do you think he earned? I would, I would say his take home was probably 100k. Okay, and what does he want for that business? Well, that's what we haven't discussed because he, I asked him to bring numbers. We want to do a full, full look through the books and cute and quick looks and everything, and get an actual net for what he has. Because I'm also looking at long term value of all these annual events he does. Yeah, and what you have to say is, I mean, he might have equipment that's worth that, but you might be better off, you know, just buying the. You know, I don't know if what you're buying, buying the relationship, selling the equipment and leasing it, or I mean, I mean, the question is just because it's worth that. Is it worth that? Is it good? Is it easier to deploy that stuff, or is it easier to rent? Or there, I mean, there's a lot of questions that I would ask, and I don't think I can probably give you an answer right now. But what would your question be? <laughs> What's your question? Oh, well, question. See, those, well, see, those questions that you just raised, Jay. Yes. Uh, are and and I'm. I'm going to have to end the call on this. They are the most important thing of all in that. So when I was working with Weight Watchers, Heinz had bought them. Okay. And H.J. Heinz owned them. And they they hated the whole business. They did it only because they wanted the brand to slap on grocery store products. Okay. Uh, They already made frozen uh, dinners. They wanted Weight Watchers frozen dinners. Everybody would have been better off doing a licensing deal than Heinz buying the company yep. and Weight Watchers selling the company. Because Heinz wound up with something they didn't like, couldn't run, uh, hated. Um, the seller wound up giving up something kind of to Jay's story about keeping the list in the Icy Hot sale. They gave up something they didn't need to give up. So hmm. alternative deal structures here should be one of your big takeaways from this call. Mm -hmm. It should be, yes, let them bring you all the information. Get real gritty and grainy about what's there. Uh, Also about what he is really trying to accomplish for himself, financially and emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then think about this much more creatively than just Joe sells his company to Bob. Uh, What other structures might get both parties to where they want to be um, without necessarily this being a sale. Um, That will also lead you to being able to avoid your little sticking point of him voicing an interest in somehow having a piece of equity in the whole enchilada. Um, But but I'm not even going to let Jay prescribe because neither one of us should be prescribing at this point. We should be diagnosing, and we can't, so you have to. Yeah, we're meeting um, but, again tomorrow here at 10 a.m. But, but that direction Jay just gave you mm-hmm. is, it's kind of like what he said about the way they react to him in China, right? Is you say one plus one, everybody says two. Nobody says, why the hell does it have to be one plus one? And 
and that's now what what Jay has brilliantly suggested to you is the question nobody thinks to ask. Why does this even have to be one plus one in the first place? And True. with that, with that, I'm going to let you go. Okay. Uh, Jay, I profusely thank you. What yeah, a great one is fine. I, what, I'm, a, I'm what a privileged great to do this with you. Thank you, sir, and thank you all, and uh, talk to you next month. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with Dan Kennedy. If you love hearing in on these lost Dan Kennedy talks and speeches and calls, then please let someone else know about this podcast. That's how you can help it to grow. And the more it grows, the more free Dan Kennedy we can bring to you. Also, Dan would love to give you the most incredible free gift ever, designed to help you make maximum money in minimum time. Now, this free gift comes with almost $20,000 in pure money-making information for free just for saying maybe. You can get this gift from Dan right now at nobsletter.com. Not only will you get the $20,000 gift, you also need a subscription to two marketing newsletters that will be hand-delivered by the mailman to your mailbox each and every month, one from Dan Kennedy and one from me, Russell Brunson. To get this gift and your subscription, go to nobsletter.com right now.